I don't know how I follow that. <laughs> and I remember Easter, where I asked a question, and the same little guy responded. So I'm going to try not to ask any questions this morning. So, oh, that was hilarious. Um, I, I'm all right. I know y'all will remember nothing I say after this, so... Let's just go ahead and get started. Today, we are starting a new sermon series called Under Construction, where we are taking a look at what God does, what kind of work God is up to in the Old Testament. We're taking a look at how God is at work through a lot of different, uh, a lot of different characters, characters like Samuel, characters like Saul, and characters like David, of course. So we're going to be taking a look at that, and while we're taking a look at this sermon series of under construction, taking a look at how God is at work, because, well, let's be honest, all of us are a piece of work sometimes. But thanks be to God that we serve a God who is always at work. And so with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we are thankful for the word that you have given us. We thank you for the gift of laughter and joy. We thank you for the gift of being able to sing together again. And so, Lord, today, as we respond to your gifts, as we we respond to your word, we ask that you will speak through me, with me, and even in spite of me. And we ask this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So this morning, I want to teach you a new term that I learned a few months ago. It's a new term that uh, I think has been around for a little while. Uh, It's not Joe Biden, just for the record. But um, a few months ago, I learned this term, and it's called ghosting. Has anybody heard of ghosting before? No. (laughs) All right, I already betrayed it. I I already asked my question this morning. Ghosting, from what I learned a couple months ago, was this idea of intentionally avoiding or ignoring someone's calls or texts or even just avoiding them in public entirely with little to no reason whatsoever. Apparently, this is a new thing, or maybe it's not a new thing, but it's a new term that has developed over the years because, well, it's ironic that we live in a culture that is hyper-connected, that we are so connected with one another that these little cell phones that we have in our pockets are capable of reaching around the world and getting us in contact with somebody that, quite frankly, we maybe knew for a season of our life or maybe we hardly even know, and we are able to be connected with them. But the reason, as this, uh, the reason why this term has grown more and more is because this ghosting, if you will, has become more and more common. That even though we have these cell phones, even though we have this ability to connect with each other in the blink of an eye, just an app away from connecting to one another, all too often what happens is that there is a good relationship, whether it's romantic or not, that is going on, then all of a sudden, it's done. It's ended. And all you get is silence. Now this goes from... Uh, this involves sometimes romantic relationships, sometimes it involves uh, platonic relationships, so it's, it's, nothing, like, it's nothing that uh, is just in one category, but in fact it transcends all categories, and it seems to be common more and more, and I'd be lying to you if I, I said I'd never been ghosted myself, because there are moments where, you know, sometimes the pastor gives you a phone call, and the pastor is calling Pat Brockman to see if you, or Johnny Wade, if you'd like to be on a committee. (laughs) And all of a sudden, this is, Pastor who? Ah, I'm sorry, you've got the wrong number. Or sometimes, you know, I send text messages to some people, maybe sometimes checking in, but sometimes asking if they would fill in a role or, or fill in a need that we have, and I never get an answer back. But you know what I do see? there's a little thing on the bottom of it that says red. So I know some people have read my text messages, but some people are ghosting me right now. But in a more serious light, when we talk about ghosting, and especially when it comes to our relationships, when we are the ones that are being ghosted, we are the ones that are being shut out, it can be painful at times. 
Those emotions, those feelings of love and acceptance that we once had are now being transformed to, well, feelings of abandonment, feelings of rejection, feelings of, quite frankly, being left alone and also, quite frankly, without any hope. When this thing happens, when we are silenced, when we don't hear from somebody and we try to build that relationship back up, what sometimes happens is that we feel so alone and so at pain and so hurt that we are just simply lost because of this lost relationship. And the truth is, is that, well, ghosting is a new term. Sometimes those periods of silence, those have been around for ages. And in our text today, we are going to take a look at one of those periods of silence that stretched over years and years. And our text is set in one of those times in relation to the people of Israel. And Israel themselves are being ghosted by none other than God. I know that may be shocking to some of us. But that is what our scripture says today. But before we dive into that, I want to take a look at maybe some of the backstory of this text. We're going to begin 1 Samuel, but there's a lot of history to trace back to 1 Samuel. The thing that you need to know is that Moses, who is this character in Exodus, was called by God from the burning bush to lead his people of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage, out of the oppression of Pharaoh. And, well, Moses goes and does that, and God does all of these miracles, all of these signs, and delivers the Israelites out of Egypt, and they are on their way to the Promised Land, on their way to Canaan. And all along the way, they're journeying in the wilderness. What God is trying to do is to train them to be his people, to be his set-apart people, to bless the rest of the world. But if you've read Exodus, or if you've spent any time around human beings, you know what all too often happens is that God, who is always faithful, always committed to the Israelites, the Israelites are not always faithful or committed to God. And time and time again, they turn their back on God. And so what God does is he condemns that generation to die in the wilderness, but promises that their following generation will go into the land of Canaan. They will inherit what God has promised the people of Israel. And this includes Moses, in fact. Right before Moses died, he went up to the highest mountain and was able to look into the promised land, look at all that God was going to give them, but he wasn't allowed to go in. But instead, the person who followed Moses, Joshua, led the Israelites into Canaan. And as they crossed the Jordan River, as they went into Canaan, what happened was, well, they, they didn't enter into this land as, well, peaceful people. They came in to conquer and they conquered kingdom and tribe and city after city. And there was fighting, endless fighting that took place. And then once the fighting was done, then the land had to be divided up between the 12 tribes of Israel. And so all of this is taking place, all of this chaos, all of this movement. And you would think that at the end of Joshua, people would finally have gotten what they want. They're finally in the promised land, that things would finally start to settle down. But that didn't happen either. In fact, what took place was people began to once again rebel and wander away from what God's will was for them. And so in the book of Judges, God sends deliverer or judges to bring the people of Israel back to where God was calling them. But what we see over the span of the book of Judges is a a spiral away and a spiral down, and they are so far removed from God by the end of Judges. This is one of the final lines in Judges. It says that people just did what was right in their own eyes. Not in the eyes of God, but they did what was right in their own eyes. There was chaos. There was murder. There was war. There was all sorts of incredibly terrible things that were going on. And as a result of all of this endless fighting, as a result of all of this chaos, what we see at the beginning of 1 Samuel is that the priestly family, the family that is supposed to keep the people of Israel on track, they've become corrupted. The sons of the high priest, they, they have already cursed their own family by some of the actions that they did. And the other side of the first Samuel is what you see is uh, the Philistines, the enemies of Israel, are at their gates, threatening Israel day and night. 
about to conquer and about to wage war. And the last, the last thing that we see is that Israel is wanting to become more and more like other nations, not more and more like the nation God has called them to be. And so you have all of that. You have all of that background that is leading up to 1 Samuel chapter 3. And in verse 1, it says the most dire thing of all, that the word of God was rare and visions were seldom. And so with that, let's dive into 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, and let's see how God is at work. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not gone out yet, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, here I am. And ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came. And stood there calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. So within this time of silence, within this time where the word of God was rare, where visions were not widespread, we see God changing the paradigm right here. So this is what I want you to remember for today as we begin this sermon series. God's calls lead us to reversals. God's calls lead to reversals. God's calls lead to reversals. Now what we see in this story is at the very beginning of the story, the author notes and wants us to draw our attention to the current situation. That the word of God was rare in the time of Israel. That the visions that once were widespread they're no longer widespread at this point. Now, there's still a priestly family. There's still a family that is trying to guide the people of Israel back to where God has called them to. But as I said earlier, this family is already corrupt. And Eli, who is the, the head priest, the chief priest, his sons have already betrayed their priestly roles. And by doing that, they have brought a curse on Eli's house. And so at this point, we're in a situation where it is a dire situation. And as we read this text and as we hear what is unfolding, we should get excited. Because this period of silence, this period of ghosting is now finally coming to an end. Because it's in the middle of the night, as, as it says, the lamp is growing dim, and the, the lamp's not supposed to go out until dawn, and so, uh, so it's in the middle of the night, maybe close to dawn, and Samuel is lying in the tent sanctuary when he hears, Samuel, Samuel. And he runs to Eli, and uh, thinking that Eli was the one who called him, and Eli says, I didn't call you, go, go lay down again. And this pattern repeats over and over again until Eli finally highlights to, or finally comes to his senses, finally is able to see what is going on. And he says, Samuel, listen, if you hear somebody call you, don't come running to me. Just say, speak. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Following all of that, Samuel gets that call one more time. And there, God is standing before Samuel, calling him to a new age, calling him to a reversal. 
because the situation that we saw in verse 1 where the visions were, weren't widespread and the word of God was rare, that's not going to be the case anymore. Because of Samuel's ministry, because of Samuel's call as a prophet, he is now going to be the one that is announcing the word of God. He is going to be going around all of Israel, directing people back toward God, back to be the people that God has called them to be. But it is also through him that all of these visions are going to start happening. And we get, begin to get a vision of the future through Samuel. Because here's what Samuel is going to do. He's going to anoint a king named Saul. And we'll see next week that that doesn't quite work out the way that the people wanted. But then God calls Samuel to go and anoint another king. His name is David. And through the David line, the Davidic line, will come this other guy, hundreds and hundreds of years later, by the name of Jesus Christ. You see, in this period of silence, God's call of Samuel leads to a reversal. A reversal for the people of Israel. A people that had only known war. A people that had only known wandering. A people that had no hope at all. But here God was now taking, uh, taking it upon himself to lead them forward. And what we see in this text is that even in those periods of silence, even in those periods where it seems as though God is ghosting the people, God is always, always able to speak and to break that silence. In fact, God loves and delights in breaking the silence. Sometimes in quiet ways, sometimes in earth-shattering ways. Because again, fast forward a few hundred years, around 3 AD, if you will, it's a long time ago, by the way, over 2,000 years ago. And in Bethlehem, there was a baby born of the virgin. And in that moment, a period of 400 years of silence was broken, was shattered by none other than the Son of God. None other than the one that would be later called the Word of God. Time and time and time again, we see a God who delights in speaking a word to break that silence and to bring about a reversal. Because what we see in, in uh, Samuel is a reversal for the people of Israel. What we see in Christ is a reversal for all people. We see a reversal to being doomed to die by sin, to being set free by sin, to live in new creation. Because of Jesus Christ, we, we now have a hope and a hope after death, and that, that hope is resurrection. Because of Jesus Christ, today in our world, there are things that are entirely different. And what we saw from the early Christians is that they turned the world upside down, treating people with dignity, treating people with love, and refusing to allow for those who are in charge to have the final say. Because ultimately, God is the one who has the final say. God's call leads us to reversal. And now today, I wouldn't blame you if you felt like we were in a period where the word of God was rare. Where the visions were, weren't widespread where it, at times it may feel like God is ghosting us, where it feels as though God is silent all around us. But you know what? Today, as we sang together, you could hear God breaking through. And today, as we gather around this communion table in a world of silence, in a world where it sometimes feels like the word of God is rare and visions are seldom, if you look closely, you may see a vision. If you listen closely, you may hear God saying something to you. And that something may be the good news of Jesus Christ. That while you were yet sinner, a sinner, Christ died for you. God at work 
means that God's call leads to reversal. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.